taking a look at anti-inflammatory drugs. In order to understand anti-inflammatory drugs, we have to first be able to understand the process of inflammation, how it happens and why it happens. Inflammation, of course, is a protective mechanism for the body. It brings blood to traumatized or infected areas. It increases white blood cell migration and increases the activity of phagocytosis. There's examples, of course, of normal inflammatory processes and abnormal. Normal would be uh, swelling around a laceration the first couple days after, you know, you hurt your finger. It could be swelling around a cruciate ligament or around the stifle after a dog's torn its cruciate ligament. Those are all fairly normal and they're typically acute and they're just there, you know, to assist in the healing process. So create that migration of white blood cells, phagocytosis, in order to help with the healing process. Inappropriate inflammation, if the protective mechanism is activated inappropriately or beyond what is beneficial. So in these instances where it's an inappropriate inflammatory reaction, typically this is where the doctor would step in and offer medication. Examples of this, of course, are chronic arthritis, severe allergic reactions, or autoimmune diseases. A lot of these will create abnormal or inappropriate inflammation. Vaccine reactions, as well as just generalized allergic reactions, are a really common abnormal or inappropriate inflammatory reaction, whereby the animal reacts just huge. Their immune system goes crazy and creates this huge inflammatory response for something that's fairly minor. You'll eventually all see a dog that looks like that at some point in your life. So looking at the inflammatory pathway... After injury, the tissues respond by producing these things called eicosanoids. These produce the classical signs of inflammation, and they initiate the healing process. So eicosanoids, we'll talk about in a bit of detail, but they can be good things and they can be bad things. They definitely produce the five cardinal signs of inflammation, which are heat, swelling, pain, redness, and loss of function. Overall, eicosanoids stimulate pain receptors or increase the sensitization of pain receptors that send messages to the spinal cord. So because they're creating this inflammatory reaction and those five signs of inflammation, that results in the perception of pain. If we inhibit or reduce the production of eicosanoids, we would interrupt the inflammatory pathway and thus reduce the perception of pain. And that is, of course, the goal of many anti-inflammatory drugs. So anti-inflammatory drugs, we'll talk about two main different classes of drugs. Today we'll talk mostly about corticosteroids and specifically glucocorticoids. They relieve pain or discomfort by blocking or reducing the inflammatory process. Then we have steroidal anti-inflammatories such as corticosteroids and then we'll talk about glucocorticoids. And then we have non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. These guys relieve pain indirectly. So when we're talking overall about uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, when we're talking about steroidal anti-inflammatories, they differ significantly from non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So from here on out, essentially, we're just going to be talking about the steroidals. So when we're talking about steroidals, they relieve pain indirectly. So that means that they relieve pain by preventing that huge um, inflammatory pathway. So by preventing the inflammatory reaction in the first place, they're preventing pain in a secondary measure or in a secondary method. So for this reason, they were not considered true analgesic drugs. However, when we look at the broader class of anti-inflammatories, including NSAIDs, a lot of NSAIDs, going back to them, have quicker onset and greater activity than many opioids. And we'll talk about NSAIDs in detail because some of them even have a primary action on pain as well as the secondary. Main thing here is always, 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 always pay attention to the changes in in medicine because NSAIDs and anti-inflammatory drugs in general are changing quite rapidly and there's always new ones coming out onto the market. So the arachidonic acid pathway is essentially the inflammatory pathway. This sequence overall um, starts with the trauma to the cell membrane which causes the phospholipid molecules that comprise the cellular membrane to be converted into arachidonic acid. This, this happens because of the enzyme phospholipase. The arachidonic acid is then acted on by either cyclooxygenase enzymes, COX, COX-1 or COX-2, to produce eicosanoids called prostaglandins and thromboxins, or by the enzy enzyme lipooxygenase, which produces another group of inflammatory mediators called leukotrienes. They vary widely overall in the variety of physiological reactions, and we'll talk about that as we talk about NSAIDs and anti-inflammatory steroidal drugs. 
But in general, the eicosanoids that we're talking about are generally associated with inflammatory reactions. So we'll look at that again. So looking at these guys, the eventual production of mediators of inflammation, prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes are called eicosanoids. So when we're talking about eicosanoids, that's what we're specifically looking at. So after this phospholipase splits the phospholipid bilayer of the membrane to produce arachidonic acid, we go through this, this phase where either cyclooxygenase or lipoxygenase creates these sort of side products called prostaglandins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. Now, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the different types of medication, of course. Corticosteroids, we're looking at the stop of this whole inflammatory pathway, especially glucocorticoids, right at the phospholipase. So they prevent that phospholipase from splitting from the lip, uh, phospholipid layer of the membrane. So they stop the whole inflammatory reaction right from the start. Whereas when we're talking about NSAIDs, or non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they focus more so on COX-1 and COX-2 and its prevention of the inflammatory reaction from that point. So corticosteroids overall block the uh, phospholipases of the arachidonic acid pathway. They stabilize the cell membranes by doing this, and they provide indirect COX inhibition. So they prevent that development of COX-1 and COX-2 because they're stopping it right from the beginning. There are two types, both produced in the adrenal cortex. So essentially corticosteroids mimic the hormones that are naturally produced by the adrenal cortex and each have very different effects on the body. Mineral corticoids is one uh, class of corticosteroids. Aldosterone is the main hormone that mineral corticoids are mimicking. And overall, mineral corticoids affect the minerals in the body. So the sodium, potassium, and overall electrolytes. They have little to no anti-inflammatory effect. The drugs we're talking about mainly are percortin V, which is this picture on the right, which is an injectable form of a mineral corticoid, which we often use for Addison's. There's another one as well called Florinaf, which we also use for Addison's, which is in an oral form. In general, animals who have a low functioning adrenal gland cortex, can they end up resulting in a deadly imbalance of really high potassium and really low sodium, which is this thing called Addison's disease or hypoadrenocorticism. So we will talk about all of this in much greater detail when we talk about drugs of the endocrine system. So don't worry about that too much for now. Glucocorticoids are the other type of corticosteroids. Their effects are definitely dose related. So in general, they reduce inflammation, they stabilize cellular lysosomes so that the cells don't um, rupture in general, they stabilize capillary endothelium, they reduce allergens and immune-mediated diseases, and they decrease fibroblast function. So what that means, the fibroblasts, of course, I think of them as the body's own little tiny little band-aids, and they go in and they create scar tissue and they help in the healing process. So glucocorticoids are going to decrease that, which of course decreases wound healing and scarring. Overall, these drugs suppress the immune system at high doses. So they're significantly anti-inflammatory at low doses, and then they suppress the immune system at high doses. Typical uses for uh, glucocorticoids are autoimmune conditions, so in high doses to suppress the immune system in those immune-mediated conditions or autoimmune, sorry, conditions such as lupus, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. IMHA, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, is when the body's own mechanisms are attacking its red blood cells and lysing its red blood cells. And thrombocytopenia is the same thing, but with platelets. So the body is attacking its own platelets. We'll also use sort of in lower doses, uh, glucocorticoids for chronic inflammatory processes, such as irritable bowel disease, asthma, and many cancers as well. There's different types of glucocorticoids overall. We have short acting, intermediate acting, and long acting. Short acting is less than 12 hours and typically we're referring to cortisone and hydrocortisone. Cortisone and hydrocortisone, um, in general, it's not used that much in animals. In people, we use it a lot for topical medications for basic rashes. Hydrocortisone is often a component in some of the topical medications, but typically the vets aren't relying on it as its main mechanism of action. So it might be a component, but it's not relied on too heavily because it's not overly effective compared to other products that are out there. 
We also will use uh, hydrocortisone in ophthalmic solutions as well. When we're looking at intermediate acting, we're talking about 12 to 36 hours. So in, within this category, we have prednisone, prednisolone, methylprednisolone, and triamcinolone. Prednisone and prednisolone, they're the same but different. Prednisone, when it's taken and metabolized, it has to go through conversion in the liver into prednisolone. So for cats, we typically try to just give them prednisolone straight up instead of prednisone because they tend to metabolize it better. However, I've also read studies that indicate that prednisone overall is not overly well metabolized in both the cat and the dog. So that one is something that we have to watch out for because they're spelled quite similarly. Always double check the bottles, but typically we're looking at prednisolone for cats and prednisone for dogs. Now, prednisone is typically used as daily or every other day treatment for immune-based conditions such as lupus, IMHA, or thrombocytopenia, or it's used for chronic inflammatory processes. The main thing is that they often recommend every other day treatment for prednisone and prednisolone. It might be every day or twice a day to start with, and then we sort of titrate to effect and reduce the dose to effect, ideally getting to the point of every other day because of its 12 to 36 hour um, length of effect. Then we have the long acting, which is greater than 48 hours. That's dexamethasone, betamethasone, flumethasone, and isofluperdone, which generally are used in higher doses for immune suppression. So certain diseases, of course, the autoimmune diseases that need immediate immune suppression. Most often we're using these as an injectable, so typically IV or sub-Q. And often, too, you'll see these used for allergic reactions. If an animal is having a severe anaphylactic or allergic reaction in general, then we'll often give um, Benadryl as well as either dexamet typically dexamethasone. So effects on the body are many. That's good, that's bad, that's kind of the way steroids are overall. So glucocorticoids have really great effects, but they also have really crummy effects. So they prevent cell self-destruction. By preventing cell death, glucocorticoids also help maintain the integrity of the capillaries, and they reduce the leakage of fluids from systemic circulation, which in turn decreases swelling in the injured area. So it reduces or blocks that capillary leaking and swelling. And then when it comes to fibroblasts, although decreasing fibroblast activity can delay the healing of wounds, decreasing excessive scar tissue formation can prevent later damage or loss of tissue or organ function caused by the contraction of scar tissue. So again, it's good, but it's also bad because we're inhibiting the healing process from being initiated by reducing fibroblasts. But then at the same time, <clears throat> we're preventing some of the long-term issues with contraction of scar tissue. Any condition where the veterinarian is relying on phagocytosis to assist with the healing process, we want to avoid the use of steroids. Because of course, without phagocytosis, then those fungal bodies can just flourish like crazy. Steroids, glucocorticoids also suppress the cell-mediated immunity, which affects the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes. They suppress the migration of neutrophils into the wound, and they have an impact on the leukogram. So we get a reduction of lymphocytes, monocytes, and eosinophils, and an increase of neutrophils and platelets. So lots of ups and downs. Um, we use them still, you know, with caution, of course, in many patients. But they are really excellent. One thing is for cancer patients, to, there's this saying that a lot of doctors, you'll hear them saying that no pet deserves to die without the benefit of steroids. And what that means is sometimes steroids in high doses can give that animal a few more weeks of sort of pain-free, inflammation-free life when they're undergoing a cancer treatment. So one in particular that studies have shown excellent results for is lymphosarcoma. That uh, glucocorticoids can be very helpful in the reduction of lymphosarcoma. So then, of course, our contraindications, I mentioned the fungal or viral diseases, anywhere that we're relying on the cell-mediated immunity and also the phagocytosis. They alter the leukogram, as noted, and we have to be very cautious in diabetic patients. So as the gluco part of the name implies in glucocorticoids, they also have an effect on glucose metabolism in the body. Specifically, glu glucocorticoids increase the conversion of amino acids to glucose. So that's that process of gluconeogenesis. And they increase the deposition of glucose in the liver as glycogen. And they also decrease the ability 
of the glucose to move from blood into the cells, which results in an elevation of blood glucose. So because glucocorticoids increase blood glucose concentrations, animals that already have diabetes mellitus, who are given high doses of glucocorticoids, or who are put on glucocorticoid drugs for a long period of time, they might actually require an increase in insulin in order to compensate. So if a glucocorticoid drug is used for a short period of time on diabetic patients, that's all right. Or if it's in a lower dose, that's generally okay. But it's in the long term or the higher doses, then the owners have to be very, very cautious about monitoring that blood glucose level. Carrying on with some of the adverse effects of glucocorticoids, unfortunately, they have an increased likelihood of causing gastric ulcers. In the gastrointestinal tract, glucocorticoids increase gastric acid secretion and they decrease the mucus production. So this is, of course, decreasing a protective feature that prevents the stomach lining and the uh, small intestine lining from getting ulcerated from that stomach acid. So this, of course, predisposes the patient to hyperacidity and gastric ulceration. The use of glucocorticoids with non steroidal anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs, may significantly increase the risk of GI ulceration. So in general, we never, ever, 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 ever give an animal a dose of non steroidal anti-inflammatory while they are on a steroidal anti-inflammatory. We have to wait for a washout period between the two. Also, glucocorticoids can cause polyuria, polydipsia, potential in long-term and high-dose use of hyper or hypothyroidism because we are affecting the hormonal balance within the body. And of course, polyphagia. So polyphagia, it's kind of interesting if you look up... um, prednisone effects on people because that's one of the number one features that people complain about is just that they go almost neurotic for food and dogs and cats are the same and a lot of clients we have to be very cautious because a lot of clients get really irritated by their dog or cat constantly bothering them for food which I totally understand so with that this is all about education so the RVT should definitely be sitting down with the owner discussing what is to expect when the animal's on steroids And specifically, if the animal is bothering them for food a lot, the main thing is not to increase the amount of food that they're feeding them, because no matter how much you increase it, they're always going to be hungry. They're on steroids. It's a physiological thing. So we don't increase the amount of food that they're getting, because of course, they'll become very obese very quickly, but they might want to do things like, you know, break the food into five meals a day or four meals a day instead of one or two meals a day. More negative side effects, unfortunately. So overall, corticosteroids are said to be catabolic because they enhance the catabolism, so the breakdown of protein in the body, as part of their mechanism to provide amino acids for gluconeogenesis. And of course, that increases the blood glucose as well. With the breakdown of proteins over time, these catabolic effects can be observed clinically as muscle wasting, so as atrophy and thinning of the skin, loss of hair, and decreased bone density. So all of these are catabolic, um, protein catabolic uh, sort of processes that can occur with long-term use of glucocorticoids. So in long-term use, especially at high doses, the pot-bellied appearance of dogs will start to show up, and that's typically due to catabolism of abdominal muscles. So the breakdown of the protein in, in abdominal muscles or the atrophy of abdominal muscles and the subsequent loss of abdominal muscle tone, and of course they have this inability to tuck up the abdominal viscera. This is all really important for us as RVTs because we need to talk to the owners about what to expect. Likewise too, we can cause an iatrogenic, so i.e. we caused it, an iatrogenic Cushing's disease, which essentially is the overproduction of these adrenal hormones through long-term use of corticosteroids. So if we are continuously supplementing, then we can cause the body to just think that it has too much constantly, which of course results in Cushing's or hyperadrenocorticism. And then corneal ulcers are another downside or potential negative effect if we use the wrong medication in the eye. Glucocorticoids used as ophthalmic solutions to relieve inflammation in the eye. So it's pretty common for medications to have hydrocortisone, so glucocorticoid, in them for reduction of inflammation. So anytime an animal has an eye infection, typically their their eye is inflamed, their conjunctiva is inflamed, etc. So typically we'll give a medication that either has or has not ha- um, does not have a steroid in it. The main thing that we have to watch out for very, very important, is that some uh, eye medications don't clearly identify on the outside of the package 
the fact that a steroid is present. So it's not overly obvious. My one example is BNP, which is an ophthalmic solution without a steroid, and then its sister product, BNPH, which they look exactly the same, just one of them has a small H as well in the name. So it's just a thought. It's something that if you grab the steroidal ophthalmic solution and that dog or cat already has a corneal ulcer or a corneal scratch, then we're definitely going to cause it to be worse. So what ends up happening if you add that steroidal ophthalmic solution into the eye, we know that it's catabolic, so it's going to start to eat away at the proteins of the cornea. Also, it's preventing fibroblast formation. So this is actually preventing the healing of that ulcer. So with those two processes in place, what we end up with is a deeper ulcer, or worst case, a melting ulcer, which of course eats right through that layer of cornea. So as RVTs, I can't stress how important it is to double check your ophthalmic solution before you administer it if the patient has a corneal ulcer or a corneal scratch. Because if we're the ones that dispense, accidentally dispense that steroidal, anti or that steroidal eye medication, then we're in trouble, and that dog or cat's in trouble too. Another downside. So we've got Leia here, which I don't have a photo of at the moment. But Leia was a 130 pound Great Pyrenees that I had. And she, of course, had Addison's disease. So she was on tons of corticosteroids as well as glucocorticoids. So Leia ruptured her left cruciate ligament. And now that we have her on tons of steroids, remember we've reduced the fibroblasts and we've delayed that healing process. So she ruptured her left cruciate because she was probably going to rupture it at some point in her life regardless. Her healing was much slower than most dogs. And then six months later, she ruptured her right cruciate ligament, uh, ligament in, her, in her right stifle. So what this means is dogs that are already predisposed to cruciate ligament injuries or tears, they're probably going to be a little bit more predisposed because we're weakening what they already have. And then likewise, if they do get a minor tear, typically some rest and restricted exercise can help in the healing process. But if they're on high doses of glucocorticoids or corticosteroids in general, they're not going to heal very well. And then of course, if the bad knee or the torn stifle is not healing, they're going to overcompensate with the other one and we can expect rupture pretty soon thereafter of the other cruciate ligament. Just something to think about. It's something that I definitely was not overly aware of when I had this dog and of course um, it was inevitable that it would happen with my pets. <laughs> Weaning them off. So the body gets used to the circulating levels of glucocorticoids because remember that we are essentially replacing hormones in the body by giving these them these synthetic hormones, which are corticosteroids and glucocorticoids specifically. The pituitary and the hypothalamus rely on a negative feedback loop. So the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus are constantly checking into the blood to see what the levels of these steroids are. And then with that, they get this feedback loop whereby they either decide not to produce more hormones or produce more because we're running low. So we've got lots of prednisone taper, or sorry, lots of prednisone floating around in their bloodstream. So the pituitary and the hypothalamus decide that, yep, we've got enough. We're good. We don't need to produce any cortisol. The animal will be just fine. So then if we were to go ahead and stop this prednisone or prednisolone cold turkey, all of a sudden we've taken away all of their cortisol because the body has decided that it doesn't need to produce any because the body's already supplemented quite well with steroids. So the body hasn't produced enough to keep the body going without the use of steroids. So if we stop at cold turkey, <clears throat> then we're gonna swing that patient into the opposite effect, which is of course hypoadrenocorticism. So we've got lots floating around in the bloodstream because we've put it in there through the use of steroids and then we're going to stop cold turkey and all of a sudden they have zero cortisol which means all of a sudden they have essentially Addison's disease. So that's really scary because that can send them into crisis immediately. It's very very scary. Addisonian crisis they essentially try to die. It's not good. So to avoid this it's very important, and this is a huge client education conversation that you will have as an RVT, very, very important that you follow the doctor's directives regarding tapering the prednisone or prednisolone down. So we never stop cold turkey, we taper it down over time. Okay, if we pull it away too quickly, then the body through this negative feedback loop will have zero 
of the hormone floating around in the bloodstream and we're going to cause detrimental effects on the animal. So this is just generally the negative feedback loop for the endocrine system specific for the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal gland, and that the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland work together to tell the adrenal gland how much uh, hormones to produce. So overall, glucocorticoids, we use them often. We have to be very selective about which patients they're given to. And of course, it is under the doctor's directive that we dispense medication, but we need to know all about them as well because our key role here is monitoring the patient and of course, client education. So safe, to, uh, safe use of glucocorticoids, address the cause of the underlying disease. That's very important. Use a safer drug if available. So an NSAID would typically be used for a dog who you know, maybe has a soft tissue injury and is limping a little bit, we'd want to go with an NSAID rather than jump right into a glucocorticoid. Doses are always guesses, so we have to monitor it based on uh, patient progress. Avoid continuous use as much as possible. Gradually reduce the dose at the end of the regimen. Cats generally have a better response to long-term glucocorticoid use than dogs, and they are safe for use when we're vaccinating an animal. So a lot of uh, clients who have animals on glucocorticoids, they know that they suppress the immune system, but as long as they're not in an extreme immune suppression dose, then they are still safe and effective, or it is still safe and effective to give vaccinations to dogs and cats on glucocorticoids. And the vaccine, they will have an effect on the body. So some examples that you might come into contact with, of course, we talked a little bit about cortisone and hydrocortisone in the short acting class. Formation is typically topical, um, sometimes cortisone injections right into the joints. So typically that's done in racehorses or horses in general. That's to be, um, controversial, the cortisone injections into the joint. So there are two schools of thought on that. One school, of course, is that by injecting directly into the joint, we can reduce the amount of inflammation that's accumulating at the point of injury. However, the other point is that we are, of course, risking potential contamination by putting a needle through the skin. There's always that risk. And also, we're decreasing the ability for that wound to heal. So if it's inflamed because it has a torn ligament or a partially ruptured ligament, by giving a cortisone injection directly into the joint, we're now going to delay the healing and also delay scar tissue formation. So that's a little bit debatable. We also know that there's ophthalmic solutions. So BNPH is the one I was talking about previously where there is hydrocortisone in it as well as regular ophthalmic type medication. And in general, it's important to know that the short acting we typically don't use as primary medication for most topical injuries. And then we have our intermediate acting, such as prednisone, prednisolone, methylprednisolone, and triamcinolone. Formations, prednisone and prednisolone, most common is oral, as well as ophthalmic solutions. And specifically, we talked about the dosing. Uh, we try to get down to every other day dosing with prednisone and prednisolone in oral format. And then we also have prednisolone sodium succinate which the trade name is Solidelta Corta. And this is an aqueous solution for intravenous use. So we're typically using Solidelta Corta in an emergency type situation or in a hospitalized patient type situation as an injectable form of prednisolone. Then we have long acting, which are greater than 48 hours of length of effect. Dexamethasone, uh, betamethasone, those are the two most common, I would say, especially dexamethasone, that's probably your number one most common that you're going to find in clinics. Typically, it's five mg per mil. Formation is injectable, and it can go sub-Q or intravenously, depending on the type. Now, the formations, important points about formations. The key here is that you have to read the bottle, right? Because we've got dexamethasone, um, sodium phosphate, we've got dexamethasone acetate, and then just plain old dexamethasone. And the difference between them, we have alcohol solutions, suspensions, and aqueous solutions. Read the bottle, identify what it's indicated for, and what sort of use uh, or sort of what method of injection you can use it for. So of course we know that these, if they come into this type of vial, they're not oral dosing. So we need to know, based on the type of solution it is, is it injectable via intravenous, intramuscular, or sub-Q? Main thing to remember here is that suspensions should never be given intravenously. 
Okay, that's one thing. So if it's a suspension, we're not going to give it intravenously. Always check your bottles. And that is all for now.